Thanks to everybody for coming today. It's a delight to be back here in Helena. As you heard, I'm the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, and the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis has only one branch office, and it's here in Helena. And as a result, Helena has been a regional center for uh, Minneapolis bank operations since the branch opened back in 1921. And personally, I benefited greatly from this arrangement since it's provided me with an excuse to visit the Queen City of the Rockies on many occasions over the past few years. Um, and I'll have more to say about the Helena branch, and especially its uh, board of directors later in my remarks. My speech today is going to focus on the behavior of the labor market of the United States over the past eight years. At the end of 2013, many observers were concerned that the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009 had created a new downgraded baseline for U.S. labor markets. But as I will show you, the United States experienced rapid improvement in labor market performance in 2014. There is no longer evidence that the American labor market is trapped in some kind of dismal new normal in the wake of the Great Recession. In the absence of such evidence, I believe that policymakers should strive to facilitate ongoing improvement in labor market outcomes until they more closely resemble those that prevailed before the Great Recession. I'll use a series of charts to show that that process of improvement is likely to take some time. By some key metrics, the labor market did improve more in 2014 than it had in almost 20 years. Yet by these same metrics, we would need to see at least three more years like 2014 for labor market conditions to return to their 2006 levels, so before the Great Recession. It follows that monetary policymakers should be extraordinarily patient about reducing the level of monetary accommodation. Uh, I look forward to taking your questions at the end of my prepared remarks. For me, those questions are a highlight of these speaking engagements. As I'll discuss, two-way communication is between policymakers and citizens is a core function of our decentralized Federal Reserve System. And your questions are a key part of that two-way communication. The views I'll be expressing today are my own and not necessarily those of others in the Federal Reserve System and especially not necessarily those of my colleagues on the Federal Open Market Committee. Okay, I'm gonna, I'll begin with some basics about the Federal Reserve System. And uh, Sue has touched on some of this already, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll probably elaborate and provide a little more color than, uh, than uh, she was able to. I like to tell uh, people that the Fed is a uniquely American institution. What do I mean by that? Well, relative to its counterparts around the world, the U.S. Central Bank is highly decentralized. The Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is one of 12 uh, reserve banks that, along with the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., make up the Federal Reserve System. Our bank serves as the headquarters for Federal Reserve operations in the ninth of the 12 Federal Reserve Districts. And that ninth district includes the state of Montana, the Dakotas, Minnesota, northwestern Wisconsin, and the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Eight times per year, the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, meets to set the path of monetary stimulus over the next six to seven weeks. All 12 presidents of the various regional Federal Reserve Banks, including myself, and the governors of the Federal Reserve Board contribute to these deliberations. But the voting members of the committee itself consist only of the governors, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, and a rotating group of four other presidents. But in this way, uh, with all of the 12 presidents participating uh, in, in deliberations, the structure of the FOMC mirrors the structure of our government because representatives from different regions of the country have input into FOMC deliberations. Now, the decentralized system, I think, has many desirable attributes. But I think one of the most important is that it facilitates two-way communication between the nation's central bank and the nation's citizens. We're engaging one uh, direction of this communication right now as I tell you about key considerations regarding monetary policy, nat nation, national monetary policy. In the other direction, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis gathers valuable inform economic information from local contacts in a variety of ways. And I then take that information uh, forward to the FOMC as part of my contributions to the deliberative process about monetary policy. Now, our bank's board of directors and the board of directors of the branch office here in Helena are especially important sources of information to my staff and me. 
And I'd like to spend the next few minutes explaining the role that they play. So I'll start with the Minneapolis board. Um, it has nine members and meets eight times per year, a couple of weeks before each FOMC meeting. Now, in a lot of ways, these uh, meetings are, are like those of any other board, as our board fulfills its oversight responsibilities for the operations of the bank. But the central part of each of our board's meetings consists of the members sharing and discussing economic intelligence gathered from their customers and other business contacts. My staff and I follow these conversations closely, and they're a basis for what I communicate later to the FOMC. Now, this conversation among our board members would not be all that valuable if they were all denizens of downtown Minneapolis who were engaged in the financial industry. What makes the process of gathering and sharing information effective is the diversity of perspectives on our board. We get valuable information from leaders of large multinational corporations like Pentair and General Mills, philanthropic organizations such as the Wilder Foundation, as well as uh, leaders of community banks and small businesses from across the district. In this way, the board features economic diversity. It also features gender diversity. There are four women on the board. Perhaps not surprisingly, it also features geographical diversity. It includes residents of the Dakotas, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and last but not least, Larry Simpkins, the CEO and president of the Washington companies from here in Montana. So this diversity of perspectives means that my staff and I are hearing about the complex ninth district economy with its far-flung economy from a wide range of viewpoints, and that can only be a good thing. We continue to seek to strengthen our economic intelligence gathering by enhancing the relatively limited racial ethnic diversity uh, of the board in, uh, in Minneapolis. Now, I've talked about the information gathering our board does, but has, of course, only nine people, and that constrains the amount of information gathering it can do. Fortunately, our bank does have a number of other ways to gather economic information from the district, including through four advisory councils. Our most important way to gather information from here in Montana is through the board of directors of the Helena Branch, whom uh, Sue uh, Woodrow introduced to you earlier. So that, uh, uh, Sue introduced, uh, there are five members of the Helena uh, Branch Board, unlike the nine that we have in Minneapolis. Uh, <laughs> but again, I think the Minneapolis Fed Board, uh, the, like the Minneapolis Fed Board, the Helena Board's information gathering is effective because of the board's basic diversity. There are three women on the branch board. Uh, it has representatives from a number of sectors in the economy, including education, nonprofits, and community banking. Geographically, the Helena Branch Board includes representatives from all over the state, including Wolf Point up in the northeast corner and Missoula in the southwest. And the newest director on our Helena Branch Board, someone usually is from Helena. Sarah Walsh is the chief operating officer with uh, Payne West Financial. Now, during the course of her tenure on the board, Sarah may be contacting some or many of you seeking perspectives on the economic conditions of your particular industry sectors and your communities. Your input regarding what you are seeing and experiencing is important information that Sarah will be reporting on at branch board meetings. So I want to thank you ahead of time for your public service in assisting Sarah with this part of her role as a branch board director. More generally, I want to give a, a shout out to to all of our Minneapolis board directors, our Helena branch board directors, and, and all of their contacts who remain uh, uh, nameless but are a critical part of this process. Their hard work is a key part of the decentralized process of monetary policy making here in the United States. I want to thank you on behalf of the Minneapolis Fed for your dedicated public service. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this gathering of local economic intelligence is an essential input into my contributions at the FOMC meetings in, DC, in Washington, D.C. At these meetings, we decide on the appropriate stance of monetary policy for the economy. But what does this word appropriate mean? What is the FOMC seeking to achieve by varying monetary policy? Well, our goals come from uh, our creators, Congress. And Congress has charged the FOMC with making monetary policy to achieve two goals, to promote max employment, and to promote price stability. The FOMC has interpreted the second goal, price stability, to mean keeping inflation close to 
So with those objectives in mind, max, promoting max employment and promoting price stability, I now want to turn to the FOMC's performance with respect to its employment mandate over the past eight years. So I'm going to, this will be from December 2006 through December 2014. And many metrics are used to measure labor market performance in the United States. I'm going to focus on what I see as the most basic of these metrics, which is the fraction of people who have a job. So this graph is uh, the employment population ratio, that is the fraction of people over the age of 16 in the United States who have a job. And I, the darkened part of the, you shouldn't be able to see the light line, because you're not supposed to look at that yet. The, <laughs> but the dark line, you should be able to see. And um, this is a three-year period from December 06 through December 2009, includes the Great Recession. This is a period of relatively rapid deterioration in labor market performance. The fraction of the population over the age of 16 who had a job fell from over 63 percent, you can see the beginning of the time frame, to just over 58 percent. These people did not suddenly become disabled, nor did they suddenly decide that they could have more fun playing video games. Rather, there was a large group of people with talents and skills who would have been employed in 2006 who were not being utilized by the United States economy three years later. In this sense, the five percentage point decline in the employment population ratio that's depicted on this picture represents its dramatic and disturbing waste of America's most valuable human uh, resource, its human resources. So with that in mind, I'll, I'll now reveal the performance of the labor market performance from the next four years, the end of 2009 through December 2013. Now at the beginning of this four-year period, at the end of 2009, 58.3% of the population over this age of 16 had a job. At the end of the four-year period, 58.6% of the population over the age of 16 had a job. So what this means, without <laughs> rolling over the numbers, is basically employment population rose essentially flat for four years. It is tempting, but there's reasons to be cautious about viewing this constancy you see in this picture as a sign of stagnation in labor market outcomes. What's going on throughout this four-year time frame is that more and more of the baby boom birth cohort, uh, born between 40, 1946 and 1964, are reaching an age where you would naturally expect them to retire from working. So many would think that it would be natural for this demographic force to exert downward pressure on the FOMC's maximum employment goal. So the fact that this is constant is actually a sign uh, that you're fighting successfully against this demographic force. Now one way to strip out this demographic effect is to look at the behavior of the fraction of those aged 25 to 54 who have a job. So if I, if I look at those, take out the people uh, over the age of 54, I'm going to be trying to strip out the, the, the the people who are uh, hitting retirement age. Now, its behavior is qualitatively similar to what we see for those age 16 and over. The, it, you see a, a rapid fall uh, through the uh, end of 2009, and then you do see it come back a little bit. So this is in keeping with the story I told you earlier, that there are demographic forces pushing down on uh, the employment population ratio for those over age 16. And so you see that employment population is going up a little bit for the age 25 to 54, but you have to say that that pace of recovery of that four-year time frame is pretty sluggish at, at best. Now, these kinds of data on employment led more than a few observers to be concerned at the end of 2013 that the U.S. labor market was stuck in some kind of adverse new normal. Good news is, if you look at this chart, this is basically what's going on with employment population in 2014. And it shows you that this pessimism was unwarranted. The fraction of people over the age of 16 who have a job grew by 0.6 percentage points in one year. Now this looks modest in this chart. And the reason it's modest, by the way, is important to understand why it looks modest. It's because this fall was so big. <laughs> That's why it looks modest. This is uh, equivalent to 1.4 million jobs beyond what's required to match population growth alone. And it's tied for the largest December, December increase in the last 17 years. Okay. So that's what happened with employment population in, uh, in uh, 2014 for the O's over age 16. If I look at those over, uh, age 25 to 54, that fraction rose by 0.9 percentage points. And that's the largest December to December increase in over a quarter century, over 25 years.
Now, I've been emphasizing uh, the changes in the labor market during the course of the last year, 2014, and we have now received four months of labor market data from 2015. And economic activity was definitely subdued in the first quarter of 2015. Uh, my own estimate is that economic output, measured in terms of real gross domestic product, may well have contracted during that time period. Uh, we'll, we've had a first estimate that's slightly positive in terms of growth. We'll get a second estimate tomorrow. Uh, the final estimate will come, come forward next month. Um, and by final estimate, I mean final estimate for now. There'll be other estimates. <laughs> um, but basically, that was a, we had a very sluggish first quarter. Um, despite the sluggishness, key labor market metrics continue to improve, although at, at a slightly lower rate uh, than what we observed in 2014. So I would say the message from 2015 labor market data is really the same as 2014. There's no reason to think of the Great Recession as put, uh, leaving the U.S. economy, the U.S. labor market stuck in some new, uh, weak new normal. Okay, so what does this say about monetary policy? As I told you uh, earlier, the FOMC has been charged by Congress with making monetary policies so as to promote max employment. I think the performance of the U.S. labor market in 2014 has big consequences for how we interpret that labor market mandate. At the end of 2013, as I mentioned, it was uh, plausible, though depressing, to think that labor market performance had been permanently degraded by the Great Recession of 2007 to 2009. You could have thought at the end of 2013 that we were actually close to fulfilling our max employment mandate. But 2014 just blew up that possibility. Last year featured the largest improvement in labor market performance in many years. It's just not, this dramatic change is not consistent with an economy <coughs> stuck in a post-recession new normal. The pessimists were wrong. And so the FOMC should be aiming to facilitate a continuation of the 2014 improvement in the labor market. So then the natural question is, how close are we? And at any point in time, it's very hard to answer that question. There are large uncertainties about the long run level of employment in the economy. My point is simply that the strong, remarkable improvement we saw in 2014 is strong evidence that we had permanent damage to the, economy, uh, uh, to the labor market from uh, the Great Recession. Without clear signs of such damage, I think it's natural for the FOMC to treat the pre-recession year of 20, 2006 at least as a key guidepost in thinking about employment objectives. So suppose we did that. We think of 2006 as representing max employment. How long would it take the U.S. economy to get back to max employment? So what I'm going to do now is show you that very simple extrapolations that it will take at least three more years, as good as we had in 2014. So this is a graph squeezed into a, the left half of the picture that I showed you earlier, really, the graph of the employment population ratio for those aged 16 and over from December 2006 now to the end of 2014. And we can see that the fraction of people over the age of 16 who have a job in December of 2014, eight years later, is well below um, where we were in, uh, in, in the end of 2006. Now I'm going to do a hypothetical. I'm going to extend the graph by assuming the next six years were as good as 2014. Okay, suppose we had 0.6 percentage point increase per year for the next six years. We'd still be below where we were in December 2006. So six years later. So that's in 2020. I, I told you earlier you should be cautious about using this measure of labor market health because of the aging of baby boom birth cohort. So I think it's uh, useful to do a similar extrapolation using the age 25 to 54 group. And here what we've done is assume we had four more years as good as uh, 2014. 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018 were all as good as 2014. Then at the, in 20, uh, at the end of 2018, we would be slightly above where we were at the beginning of 2007. Now, I, so what this is saying is that if we have more years like 2014, enough of them, we can get back to where we were in 2006. Now, my discussion has been emphasizing the employment mandate of the FOMC. Um, and you'll recall the FOMC, of course, is charged with the second goal, which is promoting price stability. Accommodated monetary policy pushes upward on prices. In principle, keeping policy sufficiently accommodative to achieve max employment 
could lead inflation to be too high. Along those lines, some observers have suggested it's necessary to raise a target for the Fed funds rate, interbank, uh, short-term interbank lending rate, soon in order to keep inflation under control. Now, this suggestion may be theoretically plausible, but it just has little support in the data. Now, the FMC, as I mentioned earlier, has translated price stability into a personal consumption expenditure inflation, uh, PC inflation rate of 2%. Here's what inflation has looked like over the last seven years. I I'm showing you uh, headline PC inflation includes the price of energy, uh, food and energy goods and services. So this moves around a lot. Movements in oil prices translate to movements in gasoline prices. That's a relatively large fraction of the basket that individuals buy, and so this moves around quite a bit. But it's averaged less than one, it's averaged 1.3% 1 since uh, um, the start of the Great Recession more than seven years ago. As of uh, this March, it was 0.3%, so well below two. It has been below 2% for nearly three years. This is all about the past. Where's inflation going to go in the future? That's, yeah, the reason I ask that is because that's where monetary policy is going to have its impact. We can't rewrite the past. We're making monetary policy with an eye to uh, having a better future. And usually we think of monetary policy as having an impact of, about, of a lag of about 18 to 24 months. So where's inflation supposed to go? Both private sector and public sector forecasters are currently forecasting PC inflation to remain below the FOMC's target over the next 18 to 24 months and indeed beyond that. So let's look at the private sector first. The median projection in the May survey of survey professional forecasters done by the Philadelphia Fed is that PC inflation will be below 2% in 2015, below 22% in 2016, below 2% in 2017. In terms of the public sector, the minutes from the April FOMC meeting specifically state that the board staff's outlook is that PC inflation will remain below 2% through 2017. These forecasts correspond to my own. I've been saying for some time that I don't expect PC inflation to return to target until 2018. So we've got both the private sector weighing in and the public sector forecasters weighing in. They both come to the same conclusion. Inflation is not going to come back to target for, uh, <laughs> until 2018. So what should we conclude from this discussion of inflation and employment? Now, I've suggested that given the absence of clear evidence of post-recession damage, the strong labor market conditions of 2006 are a natural characterization for the FOMC's goal of max employment. And I use strong in a relative sense. 2006 was not as strong as 2000, so it's, we're not, I'm not cherry-picking some magical year relative to the all, whole history of U.S. labor market performance. Under this perspective, the committee needs to make policy choices that will lead to more great years like 2014. Not one more year like 2014, not two more years like 2014, but at least three more years like 2014. And at the same time, my out current outlook for inflation and those of private sector and public sector forecasters is that it will not return to target for three years. Consequently, my assessment is that the FOMC the Monetary Policy Making Committee will only be able to achieve desirable employment or price outcomes if it is extraordinarily patient about reducing the level of existing monetary accommodation. In particular, I don't see raising the target range for the Fed funds rate above its current low level in 2015 as being consistent with the pursuit of the kind of labor market outcomes that we are charged with delivering. I'll wrap up and we can uh, open the floor for questions. So I'm an economist by training. I was a professor of economics for many years. And econ economics is often, with good reason, called the dismal science. And, and they're, they're, I understand why people say that. <laughs> but my message today to you is one of hope and optimism. From 2006 to 2009, we saw a marked deterioration in labor market performance. As recently as a, a, a year and a half ago, it seemed like this loss of human resources might prove to be permanent. But the rapid growth in employment outcomes we saw in 2014 shattered this hypothesis. The lesson of 2014 is clear. We can do better. The FOMC is charged with promoting maximum employment. In the wake of 2014, I see no reason why the committee should not aim to facilitate continued improvement in labor market conditions. I see no reason why we should not be aiming for the strong labor market conditions that prevailed at the end of 2014. 
but you only get there if we make the right choices. The FOMC can only achieve its congressionally mandated price and employment goals by being extraordinarily patient in reducing the level of monetary accommodation. Right, under my current outlook, I continue to believe that it would be a mistake to raise the target range for the Fed funds rate in 2015. I have spent some time also discussing the important role of Federal Reserve Bank Board and Branch Board Directors in the monetary policy process. I want to conclude by once again thanking all of them for their dedicated public service. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to taking your questions.